Hey, welcome to the Metabolic Motivation Show. My name is Dan O'Byrne, former metabolically challenged business exec turned metabolism master. And each show, we're going to bring you an empowering expert or message to help you unlock your metabolism so you can lose fat, gain muscle, add energy, and look, feel, and perform your best. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Now, let the show begin. And welcome to the Metabolic Motivation Show. We're uh, really happy to have uh, Mr. Kevin Briggs on today. He's known as the Guardian of the Golden Gate, and uh, he has uh, been instrumental in preventing hundreds of suicides um, and uh, done a lot of really interesting things and, in, and in fact, now has a uh, new book coming out that we're going to talk to him about uh, so, uh, Kevin Briggs, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you on here. And, um, you know, you've got such a, such a unique topic. Um, and I think you're most, uh, most well known for, you know, preventing suicides and, and your work with the, for over 20 years uh, with the California Highway Patrol. I, and I know that you, uh, you had had quite a quite an experience there. Can you share a little bit about your your backstory? Sure, sure. Uh, right out of high school, I went into the United States Army, into the airport, airborne infantry, and I was in three years. Um, went over to Germany for a bit, but during that stint, my second year in, um, I developed cancer. Oh, really? Yeah, it was it was a tough one, testicular cancer, and you know it hits a young man very hard. Um, had a surgery in Germany and they flew me back to the States to San Francisco to Letterman Army Medical Center where I turned 21 on the day I got back. So instead of going to Vegas and having your first drink or whatever else, I was in the hospital. Wow. So I, I had several operations and some months of chemotherapy, um, but came out okay. And then after that, I went into the State Department of Corrections where I worked at San Quentin and one other prison. That was for three years. That gives you a lot of stories. Working, I bet. Working in corrections. You learn how to talk to people. And then after that, I went over uh, to the California Highway Patrol, where I spent some more than 23 years with them. Wow, quite yeah. a, quite a, uh, you've got quite a, uh, quite a career going. So... I guess what people are would probably most most interested in initially is, uh, you know, the, the 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 suicide prevention aspect, which uh, is something that uh, you know, being around the Golden Gate, I think maybe a lot of us don't realize there's. Uh, but in researching a little bit, uh, I came across this. Uh, maybe it's an urban legend or 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 something, a romantic legend. It's some people feel like these. Somehow that the Golden Gate has these this magical power to uh, between the towers, and if you if you fall from the towers, you're going to free your, yourself from your demons, and the water may be cleansing. I mean, it's it's uh, is that something that people actually believe, or is that just some internet legend? I have not had someone tell me that directly, but I have read that. Yeah. So it it may be I just haven't experienced that with the folks that I've dealt with. Um, I remember talking to a gentleman on July 22nd of 2013, and he had flown out to the bridge from the East Coast, from New Jersey. And he was over the rail, and I asked him, I go, why come all the way out here? You know, that's a long flight. All the way from the East Coast, there's got to be other places if you're contemplating doing this. And his answer to me, and this was a very, very intelligent man, very intelligent man, very articulate, just suffering from mental illness. But yes. he told me his answer was, it'll get the job done. And unfortunately, it did. Well, I, I think you may have mentioned, would this be the same gentleman you mentioned in your TED Talk, which, by the way, congratulations, a wonderful talk. And Thank you. for anyone that's out there who's interested in this in this area, uh, look up, uh, look up Kevin Briggs, uh, Ted talk. It's wonderful. Um, but, um, yeah, I think you mentioned Jason from New Jersey 
Correct. And um, and he also talked about, I think he mentioned, and, and this would lead into something else, one of the characteristics for, for people who are thinking, hey, you know, I want to be able to pick out, you know, what are some of the signs? And I think Jason talked about Pandora's box. Do you right. want to, could you share some, a little bit of that with us? Right. With, with Jason and, and Pandora's box, I spoke with his father quite a bit. And his father would say that Jess, Jason talked about this Pandora's box with him several times. And this is how profound Jason was. He says, as, as we know, um, in Greek mythology, Zeus created Pandora and sent her down to earth with a box and told her to never open the box. And of course, one day she does. So inside of that box, what flew out were all sorts of evils and plagues, sorrows, all these things bad, nothing, nothing good. But the only thing that came out of that box that was good was hope. Well, Jason says, when I open that box, hope is the greatest evil. And that's his father talking to me. And I go, wow. Oof. You know, and Jason talked about that upon the bridge. And very profound. This is how intelligent this man was. But it also shows this is what mental illness can do to folks. Right. Wow. That is, uh, that's, is profound and, and sad. It, it makes, uh, it, I have a, I have a family member who's into creative filmmaking and, uh, it makes me think this guy with that kind of creative, you know, mindset could, could, would probably have been great at creative endeavors, but, um, I guess we, we won't know. Um, well, let's, you know, let's talk about, I know that you have, you've had the opportunity, and in fact, in your TED Talk, you were um, able to share a couple of letters with some of the parents of, of people who, were, who had been uh, um, involved in some of these issues. Um, but le- one thing that I think, one thing maybe we don't think about, um, and maybe for anyone who's depressed, they might not think about, is the collateral damage uh, what would, what can you talk to us? Can you tell us about collateral damage and suicide? Right. I just read um, a statistic that they talk about for each completed suicide. There are 115 people that are affected, meaning they knew the person, something of that nature. And along with that, there are 25 people who are severely affected, meaning that it has a, a, a great impact on their life. So that's a lot of people. Wow. When you're looking at over a million people worldwide losing their life to suicide every year, over 40,000 just in the United States. Wow. So 40,000 40, Americans per year um, would commit suicide and something like, and around a million worldwide. Right. At this point, we had no idea it was that, that high. Wow. That's interesting. Um, so, you know, let's let's talk about um, briefly, if we could, um, for those, you know, for people out there, we all have, you know, people in our family that, uh, you know, maybe we uh, we might worry about or, um, well, at least this is my perception. You would, would would you always would it always be obvious if we or a loved one or, you know, a workmate, a friend who might be having problems uh, with mental illness or depression or something? Uh, what would we look for to try to pick it out? Right. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, they suffer in silence. But there are things we can look for um, with adults and, and children for this matter. But changes in behavior, if they were once very outgoing and happy and, and out of the house a lot, having dinner with you. And all of a sudden now they're withdrawn and you call them up and no, I don't feel like going out. I think I'm just going to stay in. And this doesn't occur for just two, three, or four days. This goes on for some time. Okay. And people that are feeling like they're a burden, that's a really big one. Sometimes people, they just feel like a burden to everyone, and that's kind of pushes them over the edge, so to speak. They don't want to be around because of this burdensomeness. Um, eating habits, sleeping habits, habits. If you see someone start giving away all their possessions, their prized possessions, that you know that they ordinarily wouldn't be doing this. Right. And risk-taking behavior that ordinarily they wouldn't do. Sleeping more. A lot of times people are in such pain that they sleep more or they consume more alcohol than they normally would. 
to alleviate this pain. Right. And, um, and unfortunately, one of the ones that we see with children a lot is we call them cutters. It's non-surgical self-injury, NSSI. And they're cutting their arms. They're cutting their thighs by their groin area. Uh, a lot of times this is because they're in so much pain that when they cut themselves, it releases endorphins to mask that. Oh, okay. And so there's a lot of different things that, that we can look at, but just really changes in behavior. And it's not saying that these folks are going down the path of suicide, but we do want to check on them. Maybe they're just having some rough times in their life. Uh, right now, going on, we have all the big testing, the finals and colleges and things, and that's a yes. lot of stress. Yeah, yeah, no question, no question. So, you know, let's, uh, here's here's something I, I had, um, I, I'd asked some of our uh, listeners and followers on at Metabolic Motivation to send in questions, and we got a few. Uh, one one person asked me, um, uh, if we, if you were, when you were out patrolling, let's just imagine you got a call that there's a potential suicide case. You know, someone would, someone was already over the rail um, there on the Golden Gate. What would go through your mind, and then how would you approach it? Um, you know, step by step. Right. Um, nowadays, it's, it's much different than when I first started with the Highway Patrol. When I first started working on the bridge, and I'll just tell you that yeah when i first received that call when i first began i was like oh crap what do i do now i had no training zero right so i think i was uh probably more scared than than the person over the rail because i could think if i do something wrong and they go you know it could be on me this is this is horrible but nowadays after training after a lot of different things um and speaking with folks i approach this very carefully. And for one, I would ask them their, I don't just walk right up to the rail and start speaking with them. I ask their permission to come up and speak with them. I introduce myself. They see me in uniform. They know I'm some sort of authority. So I don't need to go high. I'm Sergeant Kevin Briggs with the California Highway Patrol. I, this is not about that. Mm -hmm. This is about making a connection and developing rapport. So I say, hi, I'm Kevin, and try to get their name and ask them if I can come up and speak with them. And sometimes they don't allow me, which is good because if I had just walked right up to there, you know, it could be the results could be devastating. Right. So if I can get their permission, it empowers them. Sometimes these folks have not been allowed to be the decision makers for years. If I can allow them, oh, wow, okay, he's asking me, that makes it more human. Yes. You say, well, this isn't this isn't the cop ordering me around, telling me I have to come back and doing this. It's somebody more humanistic that's going to come up and try to listen. And if they will talk to me, I will come up and try to be below eye level with them, so they're looking down at me, not that I'm looking at the rail down upon them. More empowerment, and try to see what's going on in their life. And if they will talk to me, I'm just going to listen, and. I sit there and I will give them my full attention, however long it takes. And what I would try to do is install some hope for them, if not just for that day. That's my job. Okay, that would that's uh, fascinating. So, um, so, so yeah, the act that the the simple step of just asking, you know, for the permission to talk to him is something I think most of us would certainly overlook. We would probably the instinct I would most people would probably just want to run up and and uh, and immediately violate that probably that potential opportunity or that uh, of that person, you know, asking that person and giving them a sense of control. Um, so, uh, wow. Uh, well, let's uh, let me let me take a step back um, if. If there's a, is there for anyone else out there? Now, this will, there may be some some practitioners out there, some psychologists listening to this, or even there might be law enforcement people. Um, and uh, any other pieces of advice you could give for anyone that might encounter a you know someone in a suicide suicidal situation? Yes, um, sometimes these can be very emotional, highly emotional. So. What we try to do as negotiators is stretch that time out. Don't try to fix the problem. You're not going to fix a problem that day, generally. Okay. These folks, most of the time, have had 
years of different things building up and going on. Um, probably 90% have some sort of, of mental illness. And many, many, many times, I would say most of the time, if they were prescribed medication, they are off of it. Right. And I see that time and time again. But in speaking with these folks, in this type of situation, right then, don't try to fix it right then. You have to build rapport. And you have to be flexible. Go in with the intent to build that rapport, get the communication going. When they're speaking, really listen to the words. So many times, I think when, when we're having a conversation, we're hearing their words, but things are going on in our head of, okay, what do I have to do today? I got so many things going on. Do I really have time to listen for this for two hours? And, and we're missing a lot of different things where we could really help out with these folks. So listen to understand is absolutely crucial. Don't try to fix any of the issues right from the start. Let things come out. A lot of things with them we're not going to be able to fix. But if we can provide some hope for that day to show them, a lot of times they're, they're narrowed. They're, looking, they're very narrowed in their vision. We want to make it broader. Oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of different avenues that we have looked at. So if we can do that, we can save people out there. We can show them there's some different options available to them. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. So Kevin, in, with this very difficult task of, uh, of helping suicidal people, um, why do you feel, I mean, why do you feel you've done well at this? Well, um, I feel I've done well. I, I hate to talk about myself, really, to be honest right. with you. But well, I don't mean, maybe we, if I, I can agree. rephrase it, why would, I mean, obviously there would be other people probably who's had, you know, other law enforcement people who've had this situation. And uh, for some reason, you know, you seem to have developed a, a, you know, a protocol. You've obviously, you know, prepared yourself well. You have probably, you've, I think you've, it sounds like you've, uh, whether it's through reading or consulting with other experts, you've been able to create a toolbox, if you will, uh, and a protocol that seems to have served you well. Um, so was there, was there any, were there any specific influences that, that you felt like really helped you uh, or do you think it was a natural instinctual thing to discern the, you know, the right steps or. Well, I, I think the empathy was, was natural and being able to put myself in their footsteps, where are they standing around, wherever they're at, whether it's at, at, it's at my office, whether it's out on the bridge, wherever it's at, try to look at it from their point of view. Because it's certainly not my point of view, not my what's going on. Sure. But and of course, there's many others out there doing this same line of work that I'm doing that are doing a, a phenomenal job. This interests me very much. And of course, if you're interested in a subject in a topic, you're going to want to do research. You're going to want to go to school. You're going to want to learn more about it. And that's what I did. And I went through a lot of training. And even today, I just went through a class on uh, Monday and Tuesday. So I'm still learning. Even though I retired from the California Highway Patrol, yeah. I still go to classes to learn. It's very important. And even if you take one or two things away, that's fantastic. That's more things in your toolbox of how to communicate with folks to show them a little bit different way of maybe they can approach things. So I took this head on. And one of the things I did was each and every person that I spoke to out on that bridge, wherever I happened to be, I would ask them when we were concluding the incident in a safe location was, what did I do wrong and what did I do that was good? So I can learn off of each person off of that. You can read in the book all day long, but when you're living it and you're yeah. talking to the person right there, that's where you're going to get your best information. So that's what I did each and every time. And, and that helped me become baby steps, a little better, a little better, a little better. And, and that, you know, significantly helped me. Uh, excellent. Excellent. So getting, well, getting feedback from the, the actual, uh, the actual person you had helped, uh, oh. that's, that's such a, you know, and looking back, it's probably a no brainer, but I think a lot of us would not probably, uh, have thought about that. So, you know, hats off, hats off to you for, for that and all you've done. Um, 
Uh, well, let's, you know, time is flying by here and I want to, I want to, um, change gears uh, a little bit because you're, you know, beyond, I know you're doing other things that go broader than just the suicide prevention. Um, and, uh, you've got an excellent, uh, uh, website, uh, pivotal, pivotalpoints.com for people out there. Uh, this will all be in the show notes on our website. Um, but, uh, for anyone, people are oftentimes listening in their cars, they may not get to the website. So I wanted to mention that, but let's, let's, uh, change gears and talk a little bit about your other, uh, your other areas, the leadership, uh, and crisis management areas. And, uh, um, can tell us a little bit about your, um, about what you're doing with regards to leadership and stress, uh, and things like that. Right. What I want to show people is that. Our stress, the majority of us, starts right when we get up in the morning with the family. You have to make breakfast, get people off to school, the kids, rushing to work, sitting in traffic, getting to work. We have high-stress jobs, many of us, and getting off of work, fighting traffic all the way back home, trying to get to bed on time. We're not getting the activity that we need. Sometimes we're eating on the run with hot dogs and these different things. Yes. All these build up. And all this cortisol builds up when we're not, our bodies, uh, as humans, we're not made for this. No, no. Not for a- this running away from a dinosaur or, or a saber-toothed tiger and then being able to relax and all this cortisol and things will go out of your system. But we're having this build up every hour, all the time, and it takes a toll on us. It really does. Incle- increased blood pressure, all these things, decreased sleep. So if we can communicate better, at least this portion of it, I think we can do a a lot better with ourselves, with our families, with our work. So we start communicating. And what's going on with the folks at work? I I like to really focus on that. If someone, let's say, has passed away in someone's life, that's going to affect their work. Yes. If we are having that and we hear about it and we don't do something about it, that's shame on us. At least... Speak with them. Let them know that you're there and you know about this. Pull people aside. And one thing I I strive to do is never talk when you're angry because things come out that you're going to regret. Oh, that's, yeah. (laughs) That is a (laughs) great advice. (laughs) So being able to speak to someone, to be able to approach someone, when you see all these stressors going on, these different things in folks' life, Being able to approach them. How do we approach them? What do we say? Where do we do this at? You're asking people to sometimes release a lot of feelings and emotions that they may not do in a normal circumstance. So we definitely don't want to have this conversation in the lunchroom, in the break room with other people around. Right. Somewhere where they're comfortable. So I've developed a whole little program, and it's called the Release Program, which allows folks to get out their emotions while retaining their dignity and respect. And I, yeah. I think it works. Well, that's, uh, that's something. Uh, my mom's actually a psychologist, and uh, my father was a, was a prosecuting attorney and uh, district attorney, and <laughs> so we had quite, quite the dinner <laughs> table at times. But, uh, you know, you grow up with these models, um, and, and you might have, have, have had this in your background, especially with the military. I mean, like, especially for men, you know, we're sort of taught, you know, you're not supposed to, uh, to show your pain or you're not supposed to, you're supposed to always have, you know, be strong. And, uh, it's like, it's perceived as a weakness if we say, oh, well, you know, this is really bothering me, or at least that was the way I took it, you know, uh, and, um, it right. took me a long time for, to listen to my mother and actually say, you know, when she, actually uh, open up a little bit and get, some, you know, get, get things out. And uh, she used to always tell us, you know, a lot of times what you're, what's bothering you is like, it's like having a little piece of sand in your shoe and it's not really a big <laughs> deal, true. you know, but if you keep, if you keep it stuck in your shoe and then you add some more and you add some more on top of that, all these little things start to build up. And then it's like you have a stone in your shoe and then you're really, you know, just, uh, it become it, it can blow up and it's, uh, and it would be really easy just to take that shoe and dump out the sand. Right. So, uh, I think that's, that would that speak you, to what you're talking about? You know what? You're exactly right. And I use bricks on a back every, every time something happens, maybe you are fired from your job or you lose your job 
or you lose some investments, a, a loss of someone in your family, all this big stress. You know, if you didn't make, a t if you did poorly on a test, or you didn't get that job that you were looking for, there's a lot of stress going on. So all these little bricks on your back, and they start to bend I like you that. over. So yeah. what do we do to take some of those bricks off of our back? You know, with the communication, different things that we can do, going to the gym or just getting out and walking and enjoying the day. If we sit at our computers for four hours at a time, that's tough. That's really tough Oh yeah. to think for that long a time. And if you can get out, and I have to force myself to do this, but to get out, get outside and, and take a break for half an hour. When it's, it's tough to do. I know it's tough to do. But when you do, you're thankful you did it and you come back and you're smiling and you're happy. Okay, now let's do round two. Yeah. So get some of those bricks off your back. Your lifespan will be greater. It really will. As, as officers, as, as cops, um, there was a statistic years ago that said our average lifespan after we retire was five years. Wow. Because of the things we do and see. Now, that's a lot of bricks on your back. If yeah. we can take those off, if we can take those off, our chances of survival long term past that is much, much greater. And we're seeing that more and more with folks. This, the stress, the stress is killing us. So let's get some ways to, to alleviate some of this. Meditation, which 20 years ago, I'm 52 now, I would have never thought about. Right. Now, what are you talking about? But I've actually tried it, practice it. Um, I use transcendental meditation, TM. TM, and right. It's, and it's worked for me. It really has. Whatever it is, whatever they're doing, yoga, just walking, getting out, something that allows you to calm down, de stress, take it easy for a bit, and recoup. Yeah, yeah, I know that's, that's uh, so powerful uh, and yet so overlooked. Um, um, I was uh, speaking to a uh, really interesting uh, doctor down at, who's from San Diego. Uh, he's uh, actually you would I'll try to maybe connect you guys uh, on Twitter or something. Um, he, he was uh, and still is working with the SEALs. He is a Navy SEAL, actually. Yeah. His name is Kirk Parsley. You may already have contact with him, but uh, um, really, uh, his work fits really well into this, and uh, he sort of focuses on the sleep aspect, but uh, it's become known for what he noticed was the Navy SEALs, you know, obviously we talk about stress, you know, these right. guys are, are, are getting, you know, 20, they're on 24-hour call, and uh, they have, sometimes they have eight hours to be ready for a mission, and they don't even know where they're going, and, uh, you know, and they have to show up, they don't know when they're coming back. And they're on a plane, and they may be, you know, 30 hours in the air going to some remote place and <laughs> who knows where. And yeah. uh, so what he was noticing, though, is these guys, he was looking at the, you know, some of the health, you know, he was monitoring their health, their lab re reports, and he was looking at their hormones, and he was thinking, wow, I and mean, these are, these guys are, they're, uh, they're having problems with uh, insulin, um, with glucose, with testosterone, you know, everything was out of whack. And uh, he couldn't really figure it out because these were highly fit guys who were exercising, you know, intensely. Yeah. Um, and uh, finally, he started realizing, well, wait a minute, maybe it's the sleep. And this is a medical doctor. But, you know, this is not something that, uh, I mean, medical doctors study a whole lot, get a lot thrown at, at, at them, but they don't yeah. have, you know, everything. And he didn't know this. Uh, and he sort of learned it on his own. And, uh, you know, looked at the science and it's all there. So if we're, if we're sleep deprived, it's going to push us closer to depression, closer to, to other health problems, which you, you know, you already know about. Uh, so that's so important. It really is. I can't emphasize that enough. It's hard. I know it's hard. It's difficult for me to get to sleep, um, or to go to sleep. It's hard to wind down. Yes, it really is. If we can wind down, you know, shut off that TV take a break, read a book, um, you'll wind down, and I think the sleep will be better. It is hard. It's very difficult in this day and age because we've got so many things going on, but it's important. It really is. So you know, give it your best shot. Yeah, no question. Well, you know, the, the, uh, one of the things I was, um, that some people may not know, I, I didn't myself until I w was, went back and was reading, re after talking to Dr. Parsley, I thought, man, I need to really dig into this uh, because it's an issue for me as well. I mean, I'm a wellness coach 
And I realized, wow, you know, I've got everything going on, but going, doing, I'm doing well, I think. But I realized that my sleep was not that great. And I was having trouble, like you were saying, falling to sleep. And uh, what I realized was, is the light at night, when we're, if we look at a screen, and this is well-documented science, but the light uh, activates, you know, we're a, we have a prehistoric biology, and the human eye is connected to the brain and the pineal nerve. And when, it, when we see a bright light, that sends the signal to the brain that, it's sun, that the sun is up. And so, therefore, it activates our brain. It activates the cortisol a little bit. We get a little little shot of cortisol with that light at night. So uh, it's been really helpful for me and a lot of people that I coach to uh, to do a, to turn off all the devices an hour before you want to go to sleep. You know what? And I have heard that also. Sometimes it's hard to do. It is. It is hard it, to do. You, you want to do a little research. You want to do something always. Just your good ideas pop in when you don't have anything going on. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I want to incorporate this. So I want to research it a little bit. Boom. Now you're up again because you're excited about it. Yes. It's yeah. difficult. And I've heard it time and time again. And, and I will say that you are absolutely right to shut off the devices and get to sleep. And like for years I was hooked on, I couldn't go to sleep without having the television on. Right. Right. And, and it took a long time to break that habit. It really did. But now, it's to the point where I have to have it off before I can go to sleep. It's, oh yeah. So it's changed for the better, but. Oh it yeah. Really has. Yeah, my my uh, I've got some my wife my wife actually had that habit in the past, and luckily we've gotten over that and gotten the TV out of the bedroom and uh, oh. you know tried to create a little <laughs> a little perfect sleep environment. So uh, you're better than me with that one, then. The TV's still there. But. Yeah, it's all right. Well, as long as you get it turned off, it, you know it. it exactly. uh, you know, and one suggestion uh, that that people might find helpful with, and I'm with you with a lot of times I'm trying to get things done. I'm working on a, on a new blog post or whatever. Uh, we're working on a webinar now, a webinar, I should say, um, about how to, uh, how to optimize your metabolism, um, you know, kind of a holistic approach. And uh, so um, what I've been doing is just printing printing out things that I want to read after 11 p.m. It's just I print out and I have a, a stack of documents and okay so now I can turn my computer off and I'm just looking at the page and I find it works better because it's not you know then I have a little I have a light on but it's not that intense light from the the, the screen especially the big screens you know <laughs> right and, and but that's anyway, what we're all once, getting now we're getting these big screens yeah and next thing you know our computer screens are going to be these 60 oh. inches so we can read it better and I don't have to wear my my little readers then yeah definitely well Wow, uh, Kevin, we're going deep into sleep, which is really important for everybody. But let's let's go back to you and and for people out there who want to know more about your book. Let's talk a little about your book, uh, and then we could sort of wrap up because time is flying by, and and uh, I want to I want to respect your time. And I know you're a busy busy dude, and you've got your book coming out in July, and I understand it's on pre order now on Amazon. Tell us about that. Right, the book is called Guardian of the Golden Gate. And I put a lot of thought into this. After the TED Talk, you, you get a lot of exposure. And I had uh, a number of folks coming to me for movies and, and speakers bureaus and books and things. And it was a little overwhelming. I'm just a, a traffic cop. So I have some very good mentors. And we really stepped back from this. And I took a lot of thought into this book. And I just, I didn't want it to make it about Kevin Briggs. I didn't want to just about going, uh, the things that I've seen or done. Sure. I wanted a book to show I've had depression, I've had cancer, I've had heart surgery. These things can knock a person down. Oh, what yeah. could I do to help recover from that? How can this go into other people? What can they do? But to show what has happened on the bridge, some things were there. What has happened in my life in corrections and different things. And then there are stories there. That what have ha what has happened on the Golden Gate Bridge with the suicides? Some people have came back, other people have jumped. The ones that have jumped, what happens with the families? And I go into that deeper, and I have some families that are that are in there that talk about this and the devastating deal that that has caused them. How do they handle this? Some handle it well, some don't. And then 
I've incorporated my own. I, I developed this little program. It's called the quality of life. And that's what I use for me. On the very top is, is me. What do I do for me? My own self-compassion. Because I know you're, you're, we're all going to mess things up now and again. And what kind of my eating, um, all these little different things, my, my meditation, and then my support and my professional care. So these three blocks build my quality of life. But also this release program that I've developed. And you know, it, it goes with being able to recognize, engage, listen, empathy, accept, support, and encourage. And that allows folks, it, it, it'll give you, as the one who's going to speak, a, a path on how to do this and signs and, and symptoms to look for, but also allows the listener, the one that you're going to speak to, a way to communicate with you that they're going to still retain their dignity. So I have that incorporated into there, plus some stories of folks who contacted me after that TED Talk that I did not deal with, but they've had this route to where they went downhill quickly for years and how they built up. And yes. some didn't build up, but they're still here. And yes. maybe they haven't progressed as, as well, but they're doing good. And how did this happen? So I didn't want this to be just the Kevin Briggs story, but others folks too, and how they are battling what's going on with them um, to make a better life for themselves. And what happens when we do lose folks? We're all in this together. You are, what I will say is this, you are not alone. Okay. It's very well, important. That, well, that's a, that's a great message. And before I get to my last question, um, I wanted to just take a, take a second and, uh, you know, and, and recognize you and salute you for, for everything you've done. You've made a huge difference, you know, already at, uh, and you've got, you know, probably decades decades uh, uh to go in the future <laughs> you're still a young you well, know you're still you. a young guy <laughs> and, my bones won't say that <laughs> yeah who knows with uh with all the you're you're right there next to uh next to uh silicon valley and they're doing all this anti-aging right. research hopefully we uh we'll both benefit and uh get get some of that but um so anyway, I really you know salute you for, and want to really urge everyone to check out uh, check out uh, the the book. Uh, the The title of the book is it Guardian of the Golden Gate? Is that correct? Is, is that yes. right? Okay. Yes. So Guardian of the Golden Gate. That's on Amazon, probably most of the major platforms, and uh, it's going to be launching again in July 2015. Is that that correct? That's when the book will come out. Yes. Okay. It's Excellent. On pre order now for Amazon. On pre order now. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, you know, you've had a lot of experience, uh, you know, with, with, as the Golden Gate Guardian, um, you know, you were with the military, you've, uh, you were with the Corrections, you know, Institute, you've been working with, uh, with some of the, the prisons and things and uh, just quite a, and in your own battles with, uh, with cancer and things. Um, if you were able to, to go back, and here's the, so here's the question. If you were able to go back in time, to travel back, uh, you went to, uh, let's say about 30 years when you were, you know, a 20 something young guy. Um, and you could, uh, if you could send a message, you know, send a bottle back and you have one, you could send two or three short messages to, you know, the 20, the 21 year old Kevin Briggs based on what you've learned in your life wisdom. Now, what would you, what messages might you send back to yourself or to anyone else? What I can think of right now, which is crucial, I believe, is build a very good support system. People who are positive that you want to be around. Um, in law enforcement, there's a lot of negativity. It's just the way it is. But build a positive source, folks that you can contact. You know, have those friends. Go out and have those dinners. Build that support group. People that you can talk to about whatever is on your mind and they're going to listen and you're going to listen to them. They can contact you at any time. Uh, that's why women live longer than men. I call them, they get chatty, chatty, Cathy kind of thing. Right. But it's because they can bear everything. They, they can talk about what's going on in their lives where we hold it up. Yes. You know, you, 
If you have a, an issue, you go to the bar, you have a drink, you suck it up, you come back the next day and you do it again. Right. Well, your lifespan is not going to be that long. Yeah. So good. I would, you know, that support group, if I had one word, I would advise, and it maybe doesn't matter what age. Sure. Get that support group. There's so many little clubs and different things that you can look at. So that support group is, is crucial. Excellent. Wow, that's a, that's very powerful. And you know the the science uh, the science is bearing that out. Uh, uh, your point was great. You know, women live longer. Uh, they've actually shown that women. You know, sharing sharing your your stories or your you know whatever your trials and tribulations actually lowers that cortisol level, and then it increases the uh, other you know social hormones. The um, feel good hormones, if you will, the dopamine and the oxytocin and these things. And, uh, there's even another study on the blue zones, uh, that's, uh, the blue zones of these areas. You may have heard about the, the, where the, uh, population lives to near around a hundred and they usually have a, and the strong social sharing component, but not sharing on the internet, <laughs> sharing you know, in, in real, you know, person to person. Book. You're right. Yeah. I have the book. I'm reading the book as now. How are you? All right. All right. I've got national- it. I've got it behind me. One of those hundreds <laughs> of books over there. And uh, yeah. excellent. I heard the gentleman speak and at the National Conference for Behavioral Health in Florida a few weeks ago. I said, "Wow, is that interesting?" Then they had his book there. So, oh yeah, I, I have his book. Oh, what? Well, that's excellent. That is excellent. I'm jealous. That's one great thing about about being in the states. You can you can get there's a lot a lot more conferences. Uh, you know, as far as personal development and that kind of stuff. In Europe, it's there's not as much of that. I can go. I have to go over to London to. Uh, um, although in the future, uh, Kevin, we uh, I want to put you on our list because. Uh, in the future, we have a dream of creating a conference here in Southern Europe. I'm in Spain and sort of a, uh, you know, around, I don't know how it's going to, how it's going to be titled. Um, but the idea is, you know, people who are people who want to help people to, uh, to, to live better lives, uh, to be, to optimize what their selves and, uh, you know, and feel better, live better, look better, perform better, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, hopefully we'll be able to hook up with you and get hook in our at our European conference sometime in the future. Fantastic, love to do it. Love Excellent, to do it. look forward to it. Excellent. Well, once again, a big thank you, Kevin, uh, to you and to everyone out there. Uh, uh, for people who want to find you online, uh, can you just mention your website again for us? Right. So it's www.pivotal-points.com. Okay, excellent. And uh, I think from experience, just if you just Google, I just Googled Kevin Briggs, and I also I found it pretty pretty easy to find your your website comes up pretty fast. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to reading your book, um, and uh, hopefully I'll take it on vacation with me. We're going to go over to uh, <laughs> to go over to Portugal later on this year for a little. Oh, fantastic! Little, yeah, try to do a little surfing and. Uh, um, so that'll be a lot of fun. That's awesome. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, best of luck with the book, with all of everything you're doing. And, uh, once again, you know, hats off, uh, and we will let you know when this, uh, this will be online. It'll go a rich, go up on Google. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, of course, Google, but through, firstly on YouTube, <laughs> which is owned by Google. So, uh, and we'll let you know so that you guys can maybe share it and, and, uh, also Will with do. your people. Absolutely. I'd love to put it on my website. Fantastic. Wonderful, well, Kevin. Thank, thank you. you again, and best of luck with your book. Thank you so much. Absolutely my pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure, too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Hey, before you go, three quick things. Uh, first, if you like this video, please share it. Second, if you'd like to empower yourself on a regular basis, check out all the uh, free information we have over at metabolicmotivation.com. And thirdly, if you'd like to fast track your own progress so you can look better, feel better, and perform better, we are now offering free 15-minute phone consults to answer your biggest question. And uh, all you have to do is go to metabolicmotivation.com and uh, just click on the Contact Us button. So that's all for now. Thanks again and uh, talk to you soon.